Kelly Shackelford is president and CEO of First Liberty Institute, the largest legal firm in the nation dedicated exclu exclusively to protecting religious freedom for all Americans. Kelly has served in this role since 1997 and leads First Liberty's efforts to defend religious freedom in the courts and in the public arena. First Liberty's legal, legal team has participated in cases before the US Supreme Court, federal courts, federal district courts, and state courts, where they have a 90% win record. Shackelford, Sha Shackelford, excuse me, Kelly, is a constitutional scholar who has argued before the US Supreme Court, testified, testified before the US House and US Senate, and has won a number of landmark First Amendment and religious liberty cases, including the recent watershed precedent-changing victory I hope he tells us about, American Legion versus American Humanist Association. You may have seen him, if you watch mainstream TV, on Good Morning America, the Today Show, CNN, Fox and Friends, he's very brave to go on MSNBC, or Hannity. He's also been featured in the National Law Journal, the AP, the New York Times, Washington Times, the Washington Post, LA Times, and many local newspapers. Shackelford is on the Board of Trustees of the U.S. Supreme Court Historical Society, and he earned his law degree from Baylor. Kelly and his team are fighting in the courts to uphold our freedoms and to fight cancel culture. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Shackelford to Alabama. Thank you. When you, when you start off with a standing ovation, you just need to sit down. So I, I can go nowhere but one direction. That wasn't very good. Um, thank you for a gracious uh, invitation. I, I, um, I'm gonna say something a little different. You know, with all the darkness that we see, um, I just wanna, our perspective, we're just blown away right now by God's favor. Um, we, uh, we've got three wins in the Supreme Court in the last three years. Um, we've got uh, 15 victories in the last four months, which is a record for us that quick. Um, we, the Supreme Court just took one of our cases. We're arguing December 8th that I, I normally would never say this. I think there's a 97% chance it's going to be a great victory for religious freedom. I mean, God is really being gracious to us in the middle of some really bad stuff that's going on in our country. So, but before I thought, you know, there's some people who know about First Liberty, some who don't. So let me start with the basics and then I'll sort of build to the update about what's going on. Uh, who is First Liberty? Uh, we're the largest legal organization in the country that all we do is religious freedom. So if you're a uh, five-year-old girl and your name is Gabriela Perez and you're caught praying over your meal in the lunch cafeteria and told it's not good to pray at school. And you're a poor family, you live outside of Orlando, you, you don't have $100,000 to go hire a legal team, so what do you do? Uh, or if you're Kaplan, uh, Chaplain uh, Calvert, you've been in the Army for 17 years. Uh, you Great service record, but when Trump's president, you put on your own personal Facebook page, I totally agree with the president on his transgender policy in the military, and then you put a scripture verse. And then when the new administration comes in, they say, oh, you're a discriminator, so we're gonna throw you out of the military. What do you do if you're him? You don't have $100,000, $200,000 to go hire a legal team. So we come in, we bring the top litigators in the country, they all donate their time, so that when we win the case, which we did for both Gabriella and for Chaplain Calvert just about five or six months ago, we don't just win for them, but we set a precedent that protects all of our kids in the schools, all of our chaplains, all of us around the country, our kids and our grandkids. So that's the quick summary of who we are and what we do. Um, let me start though with something that's really important, which is if you fight for religious freedom, there's a lot of people that don't understand, I'd say most people don't understand why religious freedom is important. If you're not a person of faith, it's really important. Um, even if you don't realize it. it's our first freedom for a reason. If you lose this freedom, the founders understood you will lose all your freedoms. And uh, I see this happen, you know, all the time. I see uh, people come up to me after talks from Czechoslovakia, Romania, different countries, and they say, I'm not religious, but I think that what you guys are doing is the most important thing anybody's doing in this country because I saw this happen in my country. They took down the religious symbols and two weeks later we all lost our political freedoms. 
And I'm thinking of a guy in particular handing me a check for $5,000 and said, I'm going to be supporting you from now on. And every few months we get a check from Peter. And he's not even a person of faith. He just understands what happens to his freedom if religious, religious freedoms go. And, you know, even people of faith don't get it. They tend to think, well, I want religious freedom so I can live out my faith. It's much bigger than that. I mean, the one thing that you're starting to see now as Marxism comes into the country, Marxism has to remove religion, okay? I mean, it, it's a competing philosophy. It's a competing God, really. And so the first thing that has to happen, um, you know, look at what happened in the Soviet Union. Look at what happened in Poland. Look at all these places. They had to murder the priest. They have to move the church out, okay? That's the first thing that has to happen. So the best way I can describe this is the one thing that totalitarianism can never allow are citizens who hold an allegiance to one higher than the government. So whenever that type of oppressive regime comes in, the first flashpoint is always religious freedom. There are these people that will not bow to the government because they have a God bigger than the government. And if you lose there, you lose everything. And so this is the battle. This is what it's all about. Um, I don't know if you've seen a book. There's a great book. Um, uh, out uh, by the name, by uh, Live Not By Lies is the name of the book by Rod Dreher. Um, I highly suggest you read it if you get the chance. It's only 215 pages, uh, but it basically he interviews people from former uh, communist countries, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, the, the uh, Czech Republic, et cetera, et cetera. And to a one, every one of these people who's here in the United States say they're terrified at what they're seeing. And so you ask yourself, what do you do about it? And the answer is, live not by lies. Solzhenitsyn, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's last essay before he was banned from the Soviet Union was live not by lies, which is all these totalitarian regimes exist on lies and everybody has to go along with them. If enough people, not a majority, just enough people will stand and speak the truth, they might suffer, they might not get the job, there are certain careers that might be pushed out of, by the way, does this sound familiar? Um, their kids might not be able to go to certain schools. They might not be able to travel. Again, sound familiar? Um, and ultimately, they can maybe go to the gulag, right? Um, but if enough people will do that and suffer whatever the consequences, the system can't handle it and it collapses. Because everybody sees these are lies. The emperor has no clothes. And it, it collapses. And you see the story in every country of how this happened. And so that's kind of the time that we're at right now. We're battling over whether Marxism is going to take over, whether religious freedom is going to be pushed out, whether people are going to be willing to speak the truth and pay a cost. Um, but that's where we are right now. So if this being the big battle over religious freedom, how are we doing? Well, I probably don't have to convince you. We're in a war right now over this. Uh, 10, 11 years ago, we had 48 cases. Last year, we had 321. And the types of cases are totally different, too. Um, there's, there are things you wouldn't even imagine. Look, I don't have to go very far. What did we just go through? We're still kind of going through COVID. Uh, what was the first flashpoint? When you give these mayors and governors all this power they've never had before in their life, what's the flashpoint, the first flashpoint? It probably surprised some people. Why would it be about religious freedom? Why is it shutting down the churches and synagogues? This is exactly what we're talking about. And we knew going into this that this was going to be a real difficulty. I mean, think of, uh, you know, there's no precedent in the history of our country on the Constitution and First Amendment and religious freedom during a pandemic. None. And you're going to go into court with some federal judge and say, hey, judge, I'd, I'd like your rule in favor of this church and against the governor who says he's trying to save the lives of millions of people. I mean, you, you know, that's a difficult decision to make, right? So we knew we had to be careful about the first case because this was going to set the first precedent. And uh, so we, we prayed and we waited and we had hundreds and hundreds of requests coming in from churches and houses of worship. You know, they're, they're allowing everything to be open but not the church. The, the discrimination was just clear what was going on. And, uh, but we waited. And about Easter, uh, about a year and a half ago, we got a, a call from a church in Louisville Kentucky called On Fire Christian Church and they had decided they wanted to do something to come together but they wanted to be safe so they had the idea of we'll just drive in our 
cars in the parking lot. We'll have the minister speak over a radio frequency, and we can all hear the sermon. We can all be together, even though, and I'm no CDC expert. Of course, I don't think the CDC is much of an expert these days either. <laughs> but I don't think you pass the coronavirus from one automobile to another. So it's pretty darn safe, right? The city of Louisville said that this was going to be a crime, and anybody who drove in the parking lot would be criminally prosecuted. Then the governor said that anybody who went to a church parking lot that weekend, that they were sending police officers, they would write down their license plate, and anybody in the church parking lot would be visited at their home by the police, and they would be quarantined for 14 days. And we said, okay, we're now in China. This is the case. And so we filed for an emergency injunction in federal court uh, on Good Friday. And uh, if you'll remember at the time, the visuals we were seeing were like a father throwing a baseball with his son in the park and being handcuffed for throwing a baseball in the park. A guy coming off the beach with a surfboard all by himself being arrested. And people were wondering, is the Constitution suspended? Is it still in place or is it gone? And this was, we call this the case, the shot heard around the world. Uh, and we got a great federal judge and when he saw this, he, I think one of his opening sentences was, I can't believe I'm writing this, something that I never thought I would even read in a dystopian novel, that an American city is criminalizing an Easter celebration. He said, this is outrageous, it's irrational, and it's blatantly unconstitutional, and as long as I'm a federal judge, this is never going to happen in the United States of America. And he proceeded... <laughs> He proceeded to go through 20 pages of explaining to people how this country was built, how it was built on religious freedom, and that this should never happen in the United States. So that was a great, and I think a very important victory because it was the first one. But our goal wasn't to get people back to church in their cars. So uh, our, our next case was a case uh, on behalf of Tabernacle Baptist Church in a rural area, had plenty of room, very few uh, uh, situations there with, um, you know, they, they had lots of room in the church. And not only lots of room in the church, lots of ability to do social distancing, uh, is a low COVID number of cases in the county, so a very safe way to do it. Meanwhile, in the state, it was, Ill, it was illegal for you to, to meet for an hour on Sunday, but it was totally legal for you to go to the gambling parlor for you to have thousands of people run by each other in Home Depot. I mean, you know these stories over and over again. I mean, that was a lot of fun with the governor's attorneys standing there and saying, can you please make the explanation of why COVID works for one hour on Sunday in the church, but it's a non-issue here, 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 here. And they had no response. And so by the time we were finished with that case, we not only won an injunction on behalf of this church, but Daniel Cameron, the African-American attorney general for the state, joined us and by the, in suing his own governor. And by the time we were finished, we had a statewide injunction opening every church and house of worship in the state to meet safely on a Sunday or a Saturday, if they so please. You know, I wish I could tell you that it's over, but it's not because none of these cases, if you saw stuff around the country, we won every COVID case we did, but none of the cases made the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court issued emergency uh, uh, you know, rulings. Those are not precedential rulings. No case made it on the merits. So we literally are still in a battle over whether the government controls our churches and our house of worship. So we've still got a ways to go there. but. It's such uh, what we've always been telling people. When, when they come for your freedoms, they're going to start with the religious freedoms, and that's what you have to win first. We have tons of other cases though, outside of COVID. Uh, the Brown case, which we just uh, completed, this is a case uh, out of Florida where somebody served on a jury. They finished all through the trial. They're in jury deliberations, and the federal judge threw them off the jury. Why? What did they do? Did they talk to the press? Did they, you know, what, what did they do? They said that they would rely upon the Holy Spirit in their determinations. And that was the basis for throwing this person off the jury. So evidently you can say the oath, so help me God, but if you mean it, then you're kicked off of juries, right? And just think what this would mean. If this is the new law, every believer who believes in the Holy Spirit is now not, not able to serve on the jury because they're going to rely upon outside sources for their determination in the jury room. How ridiculous. 
Uh, instead of three Federal Court of Appeals judges, uh, there's a, a procedure called en banc, which means you get, in very rare cases, they think that's so important that all the Federal Court of Appeals judges of that circuit meet at one time. We have all 11 of those, and we just won a, a victory saying this is unconstitutional. You cannot throw somebody off the jury. They threw out the jury verdict and said, "Don't. this should never happen again in any federal court in America. Um, but we're seeing attacks on churches. Uh, we've got I could tell you lots of cases. I'll just give you one example. A small African-American church that we just represented uh, where the city said, hey, we're going to take your property. And they're like, we're going to build our sanctuary there. And they said, well, you know, not anymore because we're taking your property. Well, why do you want our property? Because we're going to build a fire station there. There's a fire station across the street. Yeah, but we think we like that property even better. And they figured just a small church without a lot of money that they would just, you know, cave. But we brought in the best litigators, and by the end, the city decided they didn't want their property anymore. <laughs> and uh, my favorite thing is the church has now come to us here in the last few months and said that they're naming the new sanctuary after our lead counsel who donated his time on the case. So it's fun to see how this stuff goes. But attacks on churches, synagogues. We have synagogue cases all across the country. Outside of Los Angeles, New York, uh, we Houston, Dallas, we've, we've had them all over the place. Just synagogues that want to meet and not be discriminated against. It's just unbelievable the things that you fight that you wouldn't even think about. Attacks on our schools. Again, I could give you a lot of cases. Probably a good one recently is our case uh, with a valedictorian. Um, Elizabeth Turner is a uh, uh, valedictorian, won the right to be able to give her valedictory address. Valedictory address means a personal farewell. I mean, how many of us have heard a political speech or some sort of opinion in a valedictory address? That's what you do. Well, the one thing she wanted to talk about was the thing most important to her, which was her faith. And, and in the future, that would be the most important thing. She was told her speech was, quote, inappropriate. And she said, what do you mean inappropriate? Well, you, you can't use the words Jesus and God, is what she was told by the school. Well, good for her. She stood her ground and said she understood constitutional law enough to know you can't, the government can't tell me I can't talk about God. So we represented her, and instead of just having her valedictory address go to, you know, her, her crowd, it ended up being carried on Fox News and a bunch of other things and reached a lot more people than it would have before. And other, and we got contacted by another lady who saw that and called us and said, they're telling me the same thing. I'm the valedictorian in my school district and they're telling me I can't talk about God. Again, by the end of that, she was talking about God and she did give her valedictory address. But kids just having to fight for their right. I mean, if, any, if you should learn anything, these are the people who are supposed to be teaching the kids about the Constitution, right? And then you should know that you can't tell a citizen you can speak, but if you talk about God, we're going to restrict your speech. Hmm, wonder if that might violate the First Amendment. Uh, you know, that should be an elementary school level, uh, you know, concept for these principals and superintendents, but unfortunately it's not. Uh, so not only attacks on churches, on synagogues, on schools, I mean, think of all these woke corporations and what they're doing to attack American citizens. And one of the hard things is I think people have been real frustrated that nobody's doing anything about it. Uh, well, we're changing that because we just uh, started a lawsuit uh, against a pretty major woke corporation. And I think we've got a three minute video or so that you can watch uh, to, uh, to see what that's about. Lacey Smith loved being a flight attendant. The job was a perfect fit for her personality and her faith. I mean, there's, of course, adventure that's a part of it. There were so many places that I got to explore that I wouldn't have otherwise. And in the same way, that's the same thing with the people, right? You just have so many different people. And so just kind of being there and serving in a way, when you think of, you know, Jesus and the servant leadership, just being able to serve in a way that just met their need where they were at. She worked for Alaska Airlines, a woke corporation, so she was not surprised when a notice appeared on an employee-only page. So it just caught my eye because they had just posted it, and the title was, Alaska Supports the Equality Act. H.R. 5, the Equality Act. That is a deceptively named bill in Congress. The large print may trumpet equality, but the fine print destroys important legal protections for people of faith. What we're seeing now in the name of equality for people is um, equality for some right that it's believe what i want you to believe or you're canceled so she posted a comment as a company do you think it's possible to regulate morality and that's all she wrote 
but there was a great deal of thought behind it. In terms of regulating morality, laws are all about regulation. That's what they do, we're regulating behavior. Uh, morality, when you break it down, is just what is right, right? What is wrong, the idea behind that. As Christian, as a Christian, my morality comes from God. She says first the airline wrote a response to her comment. Then they deleted it, then they paused her work schedule, then they called her in for a meeting, then they fired her. They said that by my asking the question, I was such a bad person that it merited firing me from my job. And I think that that's the hard part about it, that, you know, like, what do people get fired for, right? Like, they get fired for being, you know, not caring, incompetent, lazy, whatever. And mine had nothing to do with performance. It had everything to do with my character. And that's what they fired me for, that they said my character was so bad that I shouldn't work there anymore. And the ultimate irony, what Alaska Airlines did perfectly illustrates why Lacey had questions about the so-called Equality Act. I have the freedom to be who I want, unless apparently I work for Alaska Airlines. And then all of a sudden I no longer have the freedom to be who I am, because in order to keep my job, I now have to agree with everything that the company is saying and doing. When we are determined about things, and when we make up our mind about something, when we know that we know that we know, I think that it allows us that courage. So, uh, and by the way, Lacey's not the only one we're representing. This happened to two different flight attendants. They posted uh, something on their employee page telling all their employees to back the Equality Act, which is a horrible piece of legislation that strips away everybody's religious freedoms across the country. Specifically, I mean, this is not like a, a theory. This is what it says in the bill. And um, they said, you know, we'd love your feedback or any questions you have. And so they asked a question and they got fired. So you're allowed to ask questions or give feedback as long as it's not a Christian question or Christian feedback. Well, this is the problem. These world corporations think they can just do this stuff, but this time they stepped in it because uh, we have federal laws against religious discrimination in the workplace. And we don't just plan to win, we plan to leave a mark on Alaska Airlines that sends a message to every other world corporation. And kind of a fun extra fact, the former general counsel for the EEOC, a woman by the name of Sharon Guftison, when she saw the facts, she said, I'd love to join your, your team. And so she's one of our counsel on these cases. She's the former head attorney for the EEOC. So this is gonna be a lot of fun. Um, in addition to attack, you know, woke corporation attacks, attacks on churches, all this other stuff, we've had attacks on people just trying to run their business according to their faith. Again, a lot of people have heard about Melissa Klein, Sweet Cakes. This is a young lady who started a, a bakery that that was kind of her dream. They got up to where they finally had a storefront. She's going to pass this down to her five kids, and they had a, a same-sex couple come in and say, "Hey, we want to buy baked goods," and she said, "Oh, we you know we'd love to sell you stuff." And then they came to her and said, "We want you to make a custom wedding cake for us." Well, she didn't make a lot of custom wedding cakes, but when she did, there was always a very biblical, uh, you know, uh, theme to what she was doing because that came out of her faith. And she said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. I can't do that because of my faith, but I'll." I'll direct you to somebody who'll do a great job. Next thing she knows, the state of Oregon was coming after her. Uh, she was fined $130,000. Uh, she was ordered not to speak publicly her beliefs about marriage, like that's not a violation of the First Amendment. Um, she was bankrupted. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we represent her. Unfortunately for her, she lives in Oregon, which is not exactly uh, a friendly place, uh, unless you're very liberal. And so they, they said, we don't see any problem with the First Amendment, with free speech, with free exercise of religion, with any of these things. And so uh, went up to the Supreme Court, nine to zero, they sent it back down saying, uh, we're vacating the decision below, maybe you wanna retry, this time looking at religious freedom. We've now been waiting for over a year for an opinion. But uh, um, you know, Aaron and Melissa, Aaron's her husband, they could have, you know, they could, they could have gone to another state. Lots of other states said, uh, I know Texas said it, I bet Alabama would have competed with Texas. They said, come here, do your bakery here. We'll buy your baked goods here. We're not gonna discriminate against you in this way. But they didn't do that, why? Because they knew that millions of people were depending upon them and their case and the precedent they were gonna be set for if they could run their business according to their faith. So there's all these heroes like Aaron and Melissa that are standing their ground we, again, we plan to win before this is over, but these are the kind of battles. The last one I'll mention to you is areas of the military. Um, 
I know we'll probably during Q&A have some questions about uh, vaccine mandates and stuff. Uh, this is not public yet, but you'll be seeing us file a lawsuit here in the very near future on behalf of at least 33 Navy SEALs that are being forced out of uh, the military. And it, it's, it's just despicable what they're doing. I mean, two of these guys had an appointment for PTSD help. Okay, these are people who've been traumatized. They canceled their appointments because they didn't take the vaccine. I'm like, you just want to punch somebody in the face like that. Um, you know, they should be uh, court-martialed for denying their PTSD meeting. Um, but uh, we have cases in the, a whole division that we just focus on the military. We've got the number one military attorney in the country. He's our gen uh, general counsel. He's actually lieutenant colonel. He's still in the reserves, Marine. Um, but probably one of the most well-known is the Shields of Strength case. Uh, this is Kenny Vaughn, great guy, came up with the idea of having a dog tag with a scripture verse on the back of it. And you know, people get scared when they're in the military. There's times when they really need to look down and see something like Joshua 1.8 that says, be strong and courageous, says the Lord, I'm with you. And you, you literally probably can't go to any unit anywhere in the military and not find people who have these. But under the new administration, they said, we're not going to allow these. Well, why not? Well, they said so in their letter. They said, because it says religious things on it. So you can wear profane things around your neck. You can wear whatever you want. The one thing you can't wear is a scripture verse. Well, we're not stopping until everybody in the military has the right, if they so desire, to wear a scripture verse around their neck. I mean, that's basic constitutional rights. So now some of you are saying, boy, my friend invited me to this and I heard the depressing speaker talk about all the bad cases and everything. So let me tell you the good news. The good news is we have a method of dealing with this. It's not a theory. We've been doing it a long time and it's working. And that is if you were to look at normal legal nonprofits, left wing, right wing, whatever their issue is, they have the same model. Raise as much money as you can. Use that money to hire as many attorneys as you can. Put them in an office in DC or LA or New York and then fly them around the country and cover as many cases as you can cover. That's not our model. Our model is all these people of faith who went to law school because they wanted to stand for what was right. 30 years later, these are the best litigators at the best law firms in our country, and they've done honorable work for their uh, clients, but they've never gotten to do a case for their faith or their country. Well, we sit down with those attorneys and we say, look, if we give you everything you need, like on our staff, we have top students from Harvard, from all the top law schools who all they do is religious freedom. If we give you everything you need, are you willing to give your time? And they're like, man, I've been waiting 35 years. Sign me up. Well, you know what's going to happen when the first time in their life, all their talent, all their gifts, everything they've ever learned for the first time is lined up with their faith and their love for their country. It's kind of unfair, but we now know we have them for the rest of their lives as one of our volunteer attorneys. And they give cover to the younger attorneys because these are the big partners, and they get to taste of what it's like. So if you were to go through the top 100 law firms in the United States, you'd find that they don't just donate their time. They literally will fight each other over who gets to donate their time on the case. And the result of this is twofold. Uh, number one, on the average case we do, about every 10000 we spend, we get 60000 donated. So we're able to multiply resources at about a six to one rate. In addition to this blessing them, it blesses everybody because we're, we, we get a lot of multiplication of resources. But second, and this is what I wasn't counting on until it started happening, is the win-loss ratio. And that is if you watch these legal nonprofits, they're fighting sort of big opponents. They're fighting industry, they're fighting government. They were created to fight something really difficult. And so if they're really good, they might win 40% of their cases. 22 years in a row, every single year, we won over 90% of our cases. And, and that's, look, that's God's favor, but it's also his method. I mean, we're, you know, we're the largest law firm in the United States because our attorneys are everywhere. They're waiting for their turn. Um, you know, if I have a, a lawsuit in uh, Montana, my attorney is one of the best litigators in Montana at one of the biggest law firms in Montana. And when he or she goes into court and looks at the judge, they realize they were in first grade together and lost a tooth together. The ACLU attorney from New York City is playing an away game. And it's not going to work out too well for him, most likely. And you add to the fact that these are the best of the best, and they're from there, and religious freedom is 
is in the law. It's how our country was formed. We should win 90% of our cases. And so that's the good news. And usually that's where I would end. I would say, hey, we've got more cases than ever, but we're winning. Uh, but then something started to happen about four or five years ago. I started seeing something, and I started saying in speeches, I started saying, you know what? I feel like we might be able to change the future of this country when it comes to religious freedom. And I stopped saying that about two years ago because I said, we are changing the future. What do I mean? Well, we're nonpartisan, so we're going to advance religious freedom no matter who's in charge. And so we were preparing for a Hillary Clinton presidency and how to advance religious freedom. And then this Trump guy won. And we were like, okay, we got to reevaluate. And we're, we immediately saw 132 judicial seats waiting to be filled. And we said, you know, we can influence one case or we can influence the judges who are going to influence thousands of cases. And so we felt really called by God to create the most extensive vetting division in the country to vet all these judges to make sure that we did everything in our power to put on the best people for religious freedom in the Constitution that we could pick. And that's what we worked on. And again, remember our model. We've got all these litigators out there all over the country. All of a sudden, we've got a president trying to fill all these judicial seats everywhere. How do you find somebody who's top, 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 who's making maybe a million, two million, five million dollars a year that wants to make $180,000 a year for the rest of their life as a federal judge? Maybe it's the type of person that's donating their time when they could be charging their clients. So it's a lot of our attorneys are now federal judges at the highest level in the country. Um, and I think we've, you know, I've got lots of examples of this, I think, but uh, I think we got a picture, and I want to show you this picture, okay? Who's this guy, you know, with his hand up in the air? Um, graduated top of his class from University of Texas Law School, went to work for a major law firm. Uh, then. Uh, realized after about seven years he wanted to do something more significant. So he went to work in the U.S. Attorney's Office, putting away terrorists. Won a national award for putting away terrorists. And then Eric Holder came in as the Attorney General and, you know, moved him off of some of that assignment to work on LGBT and other issues. And he said, you know, uh, I'm just going to, that's not why I'm here. And he came to work, uh, left the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. So where did he go? Well, he came to work for us as one of our attorneys. Uh, you'll never find a guy that's brighter, brilliant, um, that is more committed to his faith and to the Constitution. He'd rather saw his arm off than ever move away from the Constitution. At age 38, he was made a federal judge for the rest of his life. You'll never have to worry about what this judge does on the court. You'll never have to hold his hand because he is committed to the Constitution and being an excellent judge, and he's brilliant at doing so. And you might have seen there was a Remain in Mexico policy that the current administration did not undo in the proper way, this is the judge that told them, then that's in place again, okay? He, he's going to follow the law. <laughs> Who's swearing him in? A guy by the name of Jim Ho, probably one of the smartest attorneys in the nation, probably will end up on the, on the U.S. Supreme Court. If you want to read something really interesting, read any of his opinions since he's been on the court. He, he like leaves a trail of fire behind his opinions. Uh, and he doesn't, a lot, a lot of judges like to avoid issues. Uh, Judge Ho doesn't avoid issues. Uh, he runs head on. He's got, he's got decisions on abortion, on religious freedom on racial discrimination, on you name it. I mean, you, you can't name an issue. He, he hasn't addressed fully with what the law says and dealing with that. And uh, Jim Ho was our most active volunteer attorney in the country before he became a federal court of appeals judge. So these are the kind of people, and I, I could go on and on, 234 of these. But when you put great judges on the court, what happens is they're actually taking you back to what does the original meaning of the text say? So we're moving back to the Constitution. And that starts changing the opinions. So if you would have asked me five years ago, uh, under, there's two religion clauses, an establishment clause and a free exercise clause. Both have a horrible opinion underneath them that have been there for many, many decades that has caused incredible damage to religious freedom. If you'd have asked me five years ago, can you get rid of those, I'd have said not in my lifetime. I can pick away at them, but there's no way. I mean, one of them has been cited probably 50,000 times. I am now watching both of those precedents being imploded, okay? And it's, it's because we've got judges now 
who think it's more important what the text says than what some liberal court said 50 years ago that was totally bogus. And so example, uh, a lot of you probably heard of the Coach Kennedy case. Uh, Coach Kennedy is a guy who 20 years in the Marine uh, saw this movie Facing the Giants right before his, his first day on the job coaching and just was convicted and made a promise to God after every game when they go to the center of the field, the first thing I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to go to a knee and thank you for the privilege of coaching these young men. So that's what he did for seven years until somebody saw it, told the superintendent, it's really neat what your coach does. He said, what? What do you mean? They opened an investigation and they told him, you're not allowed to ever pray uh, again in public. And uh, he's a Marine, so what did he do? He went to a knee and he said a 20 second for silent prayer and he was fired for saying the 20 second. Then unfortunately for Coach Kennedy, he lives in the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco. And they said, coaches are not allowed to pray in public, quote, if anyone can see them. Okay, this is not the law, but this is the law they'd like it to be. So we went to the Supreme Court and the court said, we're not taking it yet. There's some more facts we want to develop. They sent it back down. But the four conservative justices, and this is before Amy Coney Barrett had been added, said, um, we want to add something. And this shocked everybody. They said, by the way, we noticed that the first claim to reach us in this case was a free speech claim, not a free exercise of religion claim. Maybe that's because of the Smith decision that has caused so much damage to religious freedom over the last 35 years. But we haven't been asked to review that decision yet. Not subtle, okay? Most people think that this horrible decision is in the process of being imploded. Again, this is before Amy Coney Barrett was added. By the way, we've gone back down, back through the Ninth Circuit, same hostile court. They doubled down in sort of flaunting what the Supreme Court told them. Uh, and, uh, and then they added to it, the guy who wrote the major opinion for the Ninth Circuit, he ended his opinion by quoting scripture to say that Christians should only pray in private, that that's his beliefs. And then he chastised the plaintiff, I mean, uh, Coach Kennedy, for having different religious beliefs than the judge. We're like, oh, thank you. You just gave us an additional point of error for the Supreme Court. So this case is now on its way to the Supreme Court. Um, and I think uh, it could be really significant. Many people think it might be one of the cases. If it's not this one, it's going to be another one where this bad decision is going to be really removed and free exercise is going to be opened in a way that no one has seen in many, many decades. Same thing has happened under the Establishment Clause. The Establishment Clause says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What does that mean? We don't want a nationally established church that everybody has to support and then it takes away all of our freedoms from that concept. Well, that's 50 years ago, there was a case called the Lemon Case, perfectly named. Um, and uh, they said, oh no, it means a lot more than that. It means separation of church and state. It means that if you're offended, you can bring a lawsuit. You can't bring lawsuits because you're offended, only if you're offended by religion. So our whole lives, we've seen attacks on, you know, a nativity scene at Christmas, uh, you know, a Ten Commandments display, you name it, right? We've seen all these things. Why? Because the founders had a problem with those things? No, they would have been appalled. It's because of a case called Lemon from 50, over 50 years ago. So we had this uh, case, the Bladensburg Cross case. The official name of the case is the American Legion versus the American Humanist Association. This is a cross that was put up almost 100 years ago by mothers who lost their sons in World War I. And it was on American Legion land. And then eventually, it's outside of D.C. They built roads around it, and so that the government took over the land for health and safety reasons. They didn't want to disturb a memorial, so they didn't. And then the American Humanist Association comes along decades later and says, you can't have a cross on government land. At the Federal Court of Appeals, one of the judges, I kid you not, said during the oral argument, why don't we just cut the arms off the cross? That way, nobody will be offended, and we won't have to tear it down. So they ruled two to one that the cross after 100 years was now unconstitutional. So we went to the Supreme Court, and instead of just saying protect this monument, we were looking at the court, we see there's Gorsuch is now in the court, Kavanaugh, by the way, Kavanaugh was a volunteer attorney for us many years ago, worked on cases, religious liberty cases. We th said we might have five votes to overturn Lemon. So we argued the case, and we won the case 7-2, but more importantly, five to four the justices says, we're not following Lemon. 
And people don't understand what this means, but for 50 years, we've gone in this hostility to religion approach from the government. We just turned, okay? The, this is, the case says the presumption in the law is now that any religious display is presumptively constitutional. That's a total shift, and that's going to change everything in the future. So I really believe this. If we do our job as we should, I think that every American is about to have more religious freedom than they've ever had in their lifetime. We're going to pass down more religious freedom to our children and grandchildren than we had. Now, say that about anything else, right? The only thing that can keep that from happening, in my opinion, is something really disastrous in the short term. And, you know, it could be that you've got a new administration that's doing all kinds of crazy stuff, right? But we're winning all these cases. We won 15 cases in the last number of months alone. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, we have our Supreme Court case coming up. I think we're gonna win that. Coach Kennedy, I think there's a good chance they take that. I, I'm not fearful at all about winning these cases with the judges we have and the, and the Constitution. Um, the only thing that could really do it is court packing. And if you don't know what court packing is, court packing is when one power, the party in power decides to use its power to add justices like to the Supreme Court and the lower courts to simply get to the political results they want to reach. And people immediately think it sounds like a bad idea. You shouldn't jump left or right you know, in the court. It's much worse than people understand. If you study what's happened, if you look at like, a lot of people wonder what happened to Venezuela? Court packing is what happened to Venezuela. Okay, when you have somebody come in and the party in power adds justices, it, what it does is it puts the courts underneath the political branch. It's no longer an independent judiciary. There's no longer a rule of law. It's now just a political body. And you think you have constitutional rights. You no longer have constitutional rights. You have whatever rights the majority party wishes for you to keep because they can just add justices until they take them away. And you know, again, we've got on our, we've got a website on this whole effort to stop this called SupremeCoup.com. Coup is, by the way, if you don't know French, C-O-U-P, SupremeCoup.com. And it goes through the history of all these countries and how you lose your country. This was attempted in 1936 and 37 in the United States. FDR tried this because he didn't like that they were stopping his new deal. And uh, the people of the country, and by the way, very popular president of the U.S. Senate, 80 of 100 were Democrats, his party. He couldn't get it through. Why? Because the American people, when they began to be educated on this, they were averaging 1,000 letters a day in Senate chambers in 1936 because they said, this is tyranny. This will destroy our country. And they stopped it. So we're in that same position now. Um, and I want you to watch, if you don't know very much, this is just a one-minute video. It'll show you kind of the beginning, and I'll give you the quick update on this. President Roosevelt clearly had the right to send to the United States Senate and the United States Congress a proposal to pack the court. But it was a bonehead idea. So know my opinion of court packing when the election is over. Now look, I know... It's a great question. So I'll put together a national commission of scholars, and I will uh, ask them to come back to me with recommendations as to how to uh, reform the court system. This is a live ball. Oh, it is a live ball. So we will figure out a way to get something done. Well, let's take a look and see. Everything is on the table. We're going to add five, six, seven, ten seats to the court. Well, I think everything's on the table. Everything is on the table. All of those matters will be on the table. All options are on the table. And as I've said, everything, everything is on the table. Presidents come and go. Supreme Court justices stay for generations. So what's, what's happened? Um, the president has issued an executive order creating a commission to, quote, reform the United States Supreme Court. They've been meeting. Uh, they have, they're coming out with their recommendations in early November. Uh, a bill has been filed in the House to add four justices to the U.S. Supreme Court. A bill has been filed in the Senate to add 203 judges to the lower courts. Uh, this is court packing. And... You know, you think, well, 
the country's not in favor of this. That's true. 67% of the country is against this even before they're educated. But the problem is 63% of Democrats are in favor of it. And they have the House, the Senate, and the presidency. So this literally could happen. It doesn't take a constitutional amendment to add justices, just a majority vote and the president to agree. So we're on the precipice of something very dangerous. Um, we need to do exactly what they did in 1936 and 37. We need to educate people. Because uh, everybody, I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, when you understand this, you know this would destroy the courts. The courts will be over. And so you're really not accomplishing anything that you're wanting to accomplish uh, unless you're just trying to destroy things. And again, I don't think the majority of people, that's what they want. They just want to, they think they're undoing what Trump did. They're not. They're destroying the courts. So we have a pretty significant effort underway. And that's, again, you can find all this stuff at supremecoup.com. There's even a, there's a, by the way, one of the things we did is a statement that's going to the commission right now, because as they're meeting, uh, we have people signed on to the statement like Ed Meese, former Attorney General of the United States, Franklin Graham, I mean, you name the leader. And we're, we're up, we're over 400,000 people across the country. We're wanting to build this and grow this where a movement occurs where they realize just back in, like back in 1936 and 37, this is not something you want to do. So if you haven't signed that, I would encourage you to go there. There's also a, an action area there where you can take like things that are already created, little memes and things that you can send out to your friends just to educate them. This is a nonpartisan issue. Justice Ginsburg said this is a horrible idea. Justice Breyer says this is a horrible idea. Uh, I mean, this is, you got people on both sides of the aisle, but people do need to be educated. But if we can stop something as horrible and as extreme as this, I think the future is unbelievable for religious freedom. Uh, I don't know why God's doing this right now, but I know it's happening. I've been fighting in this arena for 32 years, and what I am seeing happening is totally, uh, I mean, it's, it's just something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. And it's right, and we're just at the beginning. We're just at the beginning of this. So uh, I want to end with one of our cases this year, uh, and then I'll give you a quick update at the end, and then we'll, we'll do Q&A. Nursing was it for me. It was my identity. I did everything. If I could help them get a job or an apartment, my husband says that I am a um, frustrated social worker. <laughs> January 7th, 1984, I actually had been going to a Bible study on the book of John, and uh, it opened my heart to the Word of God being the answer, the truth. It was the best day of my life. I actually was born with a genetic disorder, retinitis pigmentosa, and I still continued nursing until I couldn't anymore because of my vision loss. If somebody says, if ever said to me, hey, you could have your eyesight, but you have to, you know, get rid of Jesus, I'd say, no, no deal. Wherever I go, I try to hand this out to people. So it's 21 chapters of the gospel. I get around with my cane to cross the street to go in the park. Going into a park to uh, talk with people is a pleasure, first of all. But knowing that eternal life is real and people don't know that they're in danger, people have been saved in the park. I've had more of a reaction from the staff on, in the park that was not too nice, uh, like they would interrupt me. There's plenty of people to talk to. I don't have to be um, going after anybody. Well, I couldn't. It would be a tripping hazard for me. I was sitting on a bench with a man that I was conversing with. The executive director comes over and he says that he was going to call the police. And uh, that's the start of um, the two-year ban, even from the library, which that was a little bit of a surprise to me, that they would ban me from both the park and the library. I'm passing out one of the 66 books of the Bible that you have in your library that people can check out. Uh, I guess my heart is broken uh, that I can't do what the Lord has told me to do.
so if you want to say that I, I think about daily the lost souls I think the Lord has positioned me right across from the park it, it's a divine uh, assignment that I absolutely need to fulfill it's it's just a must update uh, is Gail would call us probably every two weeks and say can I go back to the park and we'd say you know these cases take a while Gail and uh, she kept calling finally I told him I said let Gail know that everybody's seeing her story and maybe more Gails are being produced in all the parks and I said okay we'll tell her and they came back and I said did you tell her and she said yeah I said what did she say she said yeah yeah I know that but when can I go back to the park <laughs> And uh, we won the case. Uh, Gail's back in the park. We get an email every once in a while because she's just thrilled that somebody else has accepted the Lord. It's happened a number of times. Uh, and the guy who turned her in is now going to her church. So, you know, what power does Gail have, right? But I think it's a great example. Uh, we can win if we're faithful. You know, I'm all in. I hope you will be too. And uh, uh, one of the things I know we've got, is tell you this before we do the Q&A, I think in most of the seats we have like a card. If you want to be involved with seeing what's going on, a lot of the stuff you're not going to hear about if you're not like on our list. So the front part of the card is just your name and info. We don't ever sell your info to anybody or do anything like that. It's just a way for us to keep you up to date. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's a, car, there's a letter that'll come to you once a month, but then once every week you'll get an email because things are moving so fast. You know, what are the big cases? You know, how can you pray for Gail, right, if you don't even know she's having a case, right? So we want people praying, number one, about all these cases. And then number two, we want people educated because if we win cases and nobody knows, then really what have we won? You know, we want people to know, and you, you kind of could be the Paul or Paula Revere to let other people know, no, 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 we're winning. We're winning these cases because it will embolden people to stand. But if they're intimidated and they're not sure, then it'll, it'll keep them back. Um, so the way this card works, by the way, is you put your stuff on one side and then the other side is like any ways you want to be involved. You know, you might say you want to have a little coffee in your living room uh, like the Tomlinsons did tonight. <laughs> so that was the original idea. Um, so, you know, God had different plans. Um, but uh, we've done things all over the country and we're happy to do that. Uh, I know Jay is here. Jay, you're in the back. Jay covers um, all this area and so... Uh, that's Jay in the back, who's our guy who's out here all the time, uh, who you can always get a hold of. So anyway, we, our deal is we're looking to increase the size of the Army. And uh, however people want to serve in the Army is a matter of what their skills, life, where they are. But we'd love for you to be involved in, uh, in however you want to be involved in this. So, um, oh, and some people always ask this stuff. So I think uh, we had a total of... 25,000 supporters, families last year that gave about a total of about $19 million. Um, and we're growing every year because, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many people we've had to turn down in the last two months that we can't represent because we just can't, we can't represent everybody. Um, the need is, is growing all, uh, almost as greatly as we're trying to grow and we can't ever keep up with it because uh, we represent everybody free of charge uh, in these cases because otherwise we would all lose our freedoms because who could stand up against the government and all these entities that are against them. So love for you to be involved with us and help us grow and increase the size of the army and spread the word to other people as well. So anyway, I'm happy to answer questions or snide remarks or anything you guys have uh, from now on. Yeah, I know one of the questions is, and I'll just start with a general one, is about uh, the vaccine mandate situation. Um, let me, uh, I'll do kind of an overview and then I think the main thing everybody needs to realize if you don't already know this, maybe you already know this, is um, we have a really, really good resource. If you go to First Liberty, you spell out the words firstliberty.org, 
Um, we have a great resource uh, called a Religious Liberty Protection Kit for Vaccine Mandates. It lays out all the situations. So whatever your situation, are you in the military? It has a section on what the rights and the law is there. Is your employer the government? It has a whole section on if that's your situation. Is your employer a private employer? Yes, that's covered too. The key thing is the law protects you in every one of those situations to have a right to a religious exemption. And so that's there. Oh, I know we made a, an easy way to do this tonight. Oh, is it up? Okay. You can get this also by going, texting the word, the word first to 474747 and that'll pop you right there with the resource, but you can go anytime to the website. You'll see it at the very top because it, it allows people to go, okay, I know what my rights are. It even has sample exemption requests uh, that people have used so people can use those. But big overview real quick. Um, the problem in this area is that there's really not a lot of good law that protects you outside of uh, religious exemptions and medical exemptions, which do exist in most situations. Um, why is that? Because there's really not any case law on this. There's, there's a, a case from back right after 1900, uh, the Jacobson case, which is actually not very helpful for, I won't go into all the, the rationale for why it's not helpful, but it's, it's even before our constitutional structure that we use now was in place. It, it's very limited in its application. It was applying to a state, not to the federal government. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why it's not great, but it's all that's out there. So in other words, there's nothing right now at the Supreme Court or the federal statute that gives you bodily autonomy protection against the government forcing something into your body. Now, we all might think that's what it should be, and maybe eventually it will be with a case or with a statute or something, but right now, none of that's there. So the only thing that's already in the law that does protect people are medical and religious exemptions. And we just have a deep history in this country of protecting people's religious conscience and their religious beliefs. So, I mean, for instance, there are certain denominations that never take vaccines. What happened to those people? Were they all put in jail? No, they were all provided exemptions, okay? And the other thing I'll say about exemptions, and this is something that people don't understand a lot of times when it comes to religious freedom. The way the law works is, it, the question is whether this is a sincerely held religious belief of the person asking for the exemption, okay? It doesn't matter if your pastor agrees with you or not. It doesn't matter if your denomination agrees with you or not. All of that's really irrelevant. Now, I'm not saying that some companies are ignorant and they might, that might make them feel better for you to provide that. So if you wanna provide it, that's fine. But just realize, I mean, if you're, for instance, let's say you're Catholic. Well, the Pope says it's okay to take, well, I'm sorry, then you don't win your case. No, that's not how it works in this country. It's a matter of your religious beliefs, even if you're the only person who believes that, if it's a sincerely held religious belief. That's what the law protects. So those are some kind of big overview and how that works. But I would just tell you, go to that resource if you need it. I wish we could represent everybody. We can't because we couldn't do 10,000 cases, which is probably what we would have right now. We just, there's no way we have that capacity. So we're about to file four or five pretty major lawsuits like the SEAL Team 6 thing because we're trying to file really good factual suits that we can file in the right places with excellent judges where we can start getting some precedents that will start building around the country. So that's where we are. So you might call us or you might email us or whatever and you might have a hard time getting help because it's just overwhelming, which is why we provided the kit. We'll try to help as many people as we can, but we definitely have limitations. Yeah. All right, we've got a line forming. And first up is Matt Clark. Thank you, Becky. Oh, let me hold it though. Okay. We, we don't, we don't want a huge story. You're not going to, but you know how it is. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Shackelford, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Matt Clark. I'm an attorney with uh, the Alabama Center for Law and Liberty. We're a conservative nonprofit uh, here in the state. I, I wanted to ask your opinion because you, you talked about the possibility of getting Employment Division versus Smith overruled. Uh, and for the non-lawyers in this room, Smith is, is really the reason why the courts do not give the free exercise clause uh, the respect it deserves. Well, as I'm sure you know, uh, 
back in June, the, the court came out with Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, and we saw three of the conservatives, Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch, wanting to overrule Smith, uh, Barrett and Kavanaugh saying they wanted to take a more nuanced approach without telling us what that is, and then John Roberts, who wanted to give a very narrow victory for religious liberty, hold hands with the liberals and uh, all sit around and sing kumbaya. So, um, it looks like we've got a majority consensus that Smith is bad, but they don't know what the way out is. So what do you, and what does First Liberty think the best way is to attack Smith from this point on? Well, I think the, uh, the best way is to get a really good, you know, lawsuit before them. Um, you know, I've got a friend who has a great phrase. He said, stupid for Jesus is still stupid. Um, there, there are people that file things that they might be right, but it's not the best case, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, the case you're talking about, the Fulton County case, where they basically said Smith should be overruled, but they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, realize the context of that case. It's an LGBT case. Mm -hmm. um, I think they would be a lot more comfortable doing it in one that didn't have these radioactive other issues involved. So let's say a Coach Kennedy case. Mm -hmm. That would be an excellent case for them because I think most of the country is like, let the coach pray. Leave him alone. Those are great cases to make precedent changes because people don't, you know, not everybody goes along with the nuances, you know, there aren't the lawyers. And so most people would go, I don't have any problem with that. And that would be a great context. So I think it's a matter of waiting for the right case and giving them a little time. Uh, but I do think it's going to happen. And uh, we just got to keep bringing the right cases and hopefully getting the right case there where they'll do that. I, I think it's going to happen within the next five years. Um, and uh, it could happen with this Kennedy case. They, they already sent a signal. It's, it's back up to them. The, the Ninth Circuit kind of ignored what they told them. And we've added Amy Coney Barrett since their original opinion. So I'm, I'm prayerful and hopeful that maybe that could be the one. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, next. <clears throat> you kind of already answered this in a way, but I'm wondering on the on the mandates, are there any other, like not vaccine situations, but other situations? Um, for example, Roe versus Wade ruled on the privacy issue of that, not just the religious, but the privacy issue between the woman and her doctor. Yeah, there are people who will uh, make arguments, and I'm sure there's cases already filed where they're making arguments about uh, really, Roe v. Wade comes this concept of personal autonomy, um, and they can make those same arguments under the case law that's out there now uh, on behalf of personal autonomy versus, you know, medical things being done to your body. Uh, there's just not any precedent on it yet. That's the problem is it, it could get to the Supreme Court. They could rule on that. Um, you know, I... I I think the way the court, you got to understand the way the Supreme Court works, especially conservatives. Conservatives uh, are frustrating sometimes to fellow conservatives because they're not judicial activists. So for instance, uh, Justice Kavanaugh is what you would call a minimalist. So let's say you give him a case where he can go 10% or 80%. Everybody who's conservative wants him to go 80%. But if he can decide the case by just going 10%, he thinks it's his job to go no further than the 10%. So it, that's frustrating to people, but he feels like he's being conservative. He's being non-activist. So they tend to not like to jump and do big new things unless there's been a lot of sort of precedent below, interaction below. They see different circuits, different courts of appeals going different ways, giving them lots of thoughts, and they see all the arguments, and they feel like they've thought through everything and then they feel more comfortable. So this is something that would be very new. So I'm, I'm not optimistic that they will decide on this anytime soon. Uh, they might on some of the current laws like religious exemptions that are already in case, the protections and all that. But I mean, I do understand and I think that, that is the ultimate issue most people have is I make decisions about my body, my medicine, my medical decisions. I, the government has no right to come and put something into my body. Now again, the response you get right now in response to that would be the Jacobson decision is the only Supreme Court decision on this. And it really is outdated in lots of ways, but it's all that's there. And so I, th this is gonna have to be fought out. 
and uh, I wish that the answer to this were for legislators to pass a law protecting everybody, but that's obviously not going to happen either. So it's a really a horrible situation um, that we're in right now because uh, things are happening that we haven't seen in our lifetime, and so the courts really aren't prepared for them, and there's not laws in place to really deal with them very well. And so we're going to see a lot of litigation, a lot of things going in the courts from different directions. One thing I will say, Biden talked about this uh, a new OSHA regulation that uh, he talked about like it was going to happen. Well, it hasn't happened. Um, whenever it does happen, in my opinion, uh, if it's anything like what he described, it will be struck down as unconstitutional in a thousand different places within like two weeks. Uh, there'll be lawsuits all over the country. It's a, it would be a massive overreach. Um, OSHA, uh, well, let me put it this way, health and safety is controlled by the states, not by the federal government. Even if the federal government had some power, it does not have the power uh, to, to executive, the executive branch just on its own. It would at least have to come through the legislature. And additionally, the way even OSHA would be doing this is under, quote, because there's an emergency. Well, if there's an emergency, why are you just applying this to companies who have over 100 employees? <laughs> That doesn't sound like an emergency. Yeah, everybody who has more than 100 employees have to, has to leave for the fire drill, but everybody else can stay in the burning building. I mean, it, it really is illogical. It's, it's wrong on so many levels. And plus, a lot of people don't realize this, OSHA applies to churches, religious organizations. I mean, we've got clients lined up where as soon as they issue these regulations, we'll be suing all over the place. And I think a lot of people will be, and it will be struck down. So that, that's something that I think we can have a lot of confidence that will not be allowed. And uh, because there's case law on a lot of those things already, uh, and, and uh, I think that'll help to stop them. All right. Thank you for your powerful speech tonight. Um, I taught my stu English students for over 40 years that uh, words can change the world. And I think Amen. you've shown a good example of that. I, this is kind of tangential to what you just talked about. Uh, does the Nuremberg Accord fall in here anywhere that uh, they said that you cannot be uh, forcibly subjected to experimental medical treatment and that the punishment was death for that. Is that, or is that just totally outside uh, our judicial system? Yeah, I'm, I have no uh, uh, study or analysis of where or how or if that could apply to the United States absent some situation where world leaders got together and had something happen like that. Otherwise, I would say it's not like in our laws. It's not like something that's in a statute. It's not in a, in a constitutional decision. So I, I don't, I mean, as a concept, as an idea, as a what's right and wrong, I think it's, you know, it's something that's useful. But I, I don't know that it, it could be used in any way in a pure legal, uh, you know, action that would be brought in the United States. Okay. Step right up. Hi, um, I'm an Army wife, uh, 26 years now. I've been walking through um, medical and religious exemptions with my husband mm. over the past month. Um, last week, he was denied a medical exemption because the uh, natural immunity is not written in the NDAA, um, National Defense Act. and. Um, and so his, his religious exemption was approved by the local chaplains and has now been sent to the Surgeon General because the Surgeon General has to approve all of those. So my question to you is, um, if our religious exemption is denied, what do we do in the waiting while we're waiting for y'all to do the lawsuits? And do you see class actions um, coming into play? Because I, you know, word on the street is the Surgeon General is probably either going to accept them all or deny them all. There's so many, and he's supposed to look at them on an individual basis. But uh, and also, what numbers are you hearing? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of things we're seeing. By the way, for instance, uh, I'll just tell you this because it just so happens it's happening this week. We have a deal every week that we do called First Liberty Live, where we have a guest on, like. Uh, you know, I think we're having Rod Dreher on on his book in two or three weeks. Well, this week we're having Mike Berry, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Berry, our general counsel, to answer questions about those in the military and what to do if their accommodation is, religious accommodation request is denied. So just 
make sure and watch that for one. Um, the, and he's already talked about there are a lot of disturbing things that show there are statements. We're collecting all kinds of evidence. There are statements being made that show that they're not being made individually. Well, that's a violation of the law. They have to make the, the decisions individually. Uh, they can't, you know, treat large groups of people because, again, it's back to this, what we talked about earlier. It's that person's sincerely held religious beliefs. So um, I would say if you're denied, though, you have a right to file a legal action. And, uh, and yeah, I would encourage as many people to do that as they can. I would say something that you mentioned earlier, it just not that your husband did this the wrong way. It didn't sound like he did. But I want everybody to realize some people are so into the medical side of this that they can lose their way in making a religious exemption request. None of that really is very helpful in making. If it makes it look like you're just disagreeing with the science or the medicine, then that kind of takes you out of a religious. Because the whole point of religion is, I don't care whether you think it's reasonable. These are my beliefs. And, uh, uh, you know, well, if you were against uh, having fetal cell used for um, vaccines, then you wouldn't take Tylenol. Well, you can say, well, you know, I didn't know about this until three weeks ago, and I'm committed now. What else you got? You know, uh, I mean, they can't, when they start questioning your religious beliefs, they're on very dangerous grounds. Uh, and if you saw what we uh, released that the Coast Guard sent out, uh, that shows you the kind of stuff that's going on in the military. They wanted to, they said that all these religious requests were bogus, and then they, they tried to tell the chaplains how to cross-examine them about their faith. Um, and there's stories out because we, we got a copy of this from somebody inside. So there's a lot of stuff like this going on with these companies and everything. I would just say make, if, you, if you're making a religious exemption, make it your religious exemption. And then you've got to stand because the companies, the military will try to intimidate you out of asking. They'll say, well, you're not going to get it. Well, that's going to hurt you. Yes. So if they can... If you don't ask, then you got nothing. You can't even follow through with anything, right? And then if you ask and you're denied and you don't do anything, again, nothing. So all the intimidation is to try to keep you from living out your rights. And people just have to do that uh, and follow through the process. And hopefully the other lawsuits will start to give you some precedent. But I think every situation is so unique that everybody's going to have to follow through on behalf of themselves or else another case might not do it for you. So I would just say follow through the process. There are many of us who are willing to lose it all. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's, Amen. I mean, yeah. And back to her question, uh, when she said thousands or tens of thousands, what have you heard? What do you think the numbers are from military? You have I don't know. I don't know exactly. Mike Barry might know more because he's dealing with so many of these calls. But uh, I mean, I, and it's beyond the military too. I mean, I you know we got a call today from an FBI agent who has a medical condition. I don't, and medic and, and by the way, in federal FBI, there's no there's no religious exemption. There's no medical exemption. Mm. Well, if he takes the vaccine, his doctor tells him he'll probably die because of his condition. But he's still going to be fired from the FBI. So these are the kinds of situations that happen to all federal employees. Yep. Hello, Mr. Shackelford. Thank you for being here. Um, I was able to see you at Free Chapel with my nephew. Oh, yeah. And he has retinitis pigmentosa, and your presentation meant the world to him. Oh, that's and awesome. If you don't know what that is, that's what Gail Blair had. Yes, yeah, so thank you. And my husband's a veteran, and I teach comp and rhetoric like the other gentleman. So we have, we're just having a party here. <laughs> um, so my husband and the others in his flight department are under religious are facing religious discrimination under a mandate from the company CEO. And um, our question is, my question is, can a religious accommodation for a vaccine mandate be limited or denied in location, space, or area. Is there room for his accommodation, religious accommodation, in a jet aircraft? Or does my husband have to check Jesus at the stairs? Yeah, it, every, the way it works, you're talk, what you're talking about, by the way, and if you get into the kit, you see all the different areas. This is a private employer situation. Title VII uh, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says you cannot discriminate in the workplace on the basis of race, sex, religion. But there's an extra part. It requires that you affirmatively accommodate the religious beliefs 
of your employees if you can do so. So these tend to be very factually based about what the, now if they say we're not going to give you any accommodation, that's one thing, okay? But if they say they're willing to, re they do recognize your religious uh, issue and then you're fighting over what the accommodation should, can be, I would just say those are all real fact-based and you're going to have to be creative and pray and think and, and usually you can come up with something that solves your problem and that also avoids their alleged harm. And you just got to be creative in coming up with that. But people need to understand that when you ask for an accommodation, it doesn't mean that there aren't some difficulties for you because that's just what happens when you accommodate people, you know, they, they you know, there usually are some things that maybe you're having to do that are a little less convenient. I would say this, everybody in the military and everybody else, one of the great, oh, and one of the things that you reminded me of that everybody should do, if you're in a company and you got a CEO or an HR director or somebody who's kind of anti-religious exemption, write down, every time you see something, every time they say something, every, you keep track of all that stuff, write it down, put the date, all that is evidence later on. But I would encourage people, there's a great story, I don't know how many of you saw, um, what was the name? Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, but it's just, when it comes to the military and those serving, um, this is Desmond Doss, who was a Seventh-day Adventist who could not carry a weapon uh, under his faith. And he was a medic. And uh, they tried to court-martial him. Out. I mean, he was attacked, treated horrifically in the military because he had different religious beliefs. And uh, they tried to court-martial him. And... Thank the Lord, we have a system in this country that believes in the Constitution, and they could not court-martial him. And as a result, he went as a medic. And it, it, movie's brutal, but it really needs to be brutal for you to understand what happened. But it's, I highly suggest you, you, you watch it. In this place where these people were dying, and there was blood everywhere, and everybody in, on his team went down the hill, he refused to leave. And he crawled in the midst of the enemy, pulling one person off another, pulling them down by a rope, and he ended up saving seven, 70 Americans' lives. And every time he would turn around and go, God, just give me one more. So this, this unique religious guy with these different beliefs is what caused him to so value life that he wouldn't even carry a weapon. And that he would risk his life and save 70 people. And one by one, every one of those people went to him and said, I'm sorry. That's what America's about. Amen. And we've got to fight for the Desmond Dosses and those people and that principle because that's everything about what America is. So stand your ground. And if we can help you, we're certainly happy to. But just when it comes to the, the accommodation itself, pray, think, come up with a way to make it work if you can. Because if they're recognizing the religious, the right to an accommodation, then that's a huge first step. And all you now have to do is come up with what that should be. Well, one of the statements was there's no room for accommodation in the cockpit. Well, I'd want to know is, so does that mean you're recognizing that we have a right to one if one would work? Mm -hmm. And if they admit that, then now I'd go to the next step and say, let's figure out how we can, what, what is the harm that you're concerned about? Why, why doesn't it work in the, in the cockpit? Please tell me, maybe we can solve this and then see if you can solve it. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I actually have three questions. <laughs> I'll, I'll make it really quick. You yeah. get one. Oh, okay. Pick the best one. It's not quite as serious as a lot of the vaccine questions, uh, but many of us in here had children in schools that, you know, unfortunately were dealing with the mask mandates. Yes. We actually used the religious exemption in many cases and it was denied. Did they have legal grounds to do that? Well, it would depend. I would need to, you need to, every situation is a little different. Um, the, the, the parents have sort of a double whammy right, which is they not only have uh, rights religiously, but they also have uh, fundamental rights as parents. There are Supreme Court cases that say one of the most fundamental rights in this country is the right of a parent to direct the upbringing and education of their children. Um, and so they do have a right to control that. Now the problem is, depending upon the facts, that might be that they have a right to pull their child out of a situation. 
Um, so for instance, you can't change the curriculum if it's really bad as a matter of law, you do that politically, but you can certainly pull your child out of a curriculum that violates your faith. Um, and so depending upon sort of the circumstances, it might be that while you have a right to protect your child, uh, you don't have a right to do something that they say would affect other children uh, who don't have the same beliefs. Awesome. Stick around, I bet he'll answer the other two when it's over. <laughs> okay, well, hey, hey, she has a similar question. So <laughs> you get your second question. She gave it up for you. I, I live in Tuscaloosa and, um, no, go ahead. You, that was actually kind of her question. I see. I'm, I'm fighting the same thing. Sorry. Okay, I appreciate that. Good <laughs> yeah. deal. Uh, Teamwork. So the second question is, uh, of course, a lot of the mask mandates have been dropped in our state, so that's over with. I'm not 100% convinced that it's not coming back. So something that's uh, important to me is that we address it still and expose how it all happened to begin with. And I feel like the only way to do that would be to sue for mental and physical damages that were done to our kids while having to wear the mask. Is that something you think we could do? I think it would be difficult. Um, I think what you're trying to do would be better done in public hearings, like a legislature bringing in experts, uh, forcing this stuff in public. Um, there's a lot of really unique kind of hurdles when you try to sue like a school district there's all kinds of immunity issues there's you know they just make it hard to sue the government even if you have good claims and so if the purpose is to get information out i think a better way to get the information out is to get champions who like ha you have enough members of a committee at the state legislature and they can bring in experts and and get the word out that way and and uh, that's better, more effective. A lot of times, some of the stuff that's going on in the case might be not even public. Uh, you know, the depositions might be sealed, or you know, there's just a lot of hurdles. If you, I don't think that's the purpose you want for the legislation. I think education is better done sort of in a place where it's really supposed to happen, like a legislative hearing or a process. Okay. Thanks yeah. for mm -hmm. the tag team. Okay. Hey, you mentioned early in the presentation briefly about how Marxism has sort of become an influence in our culture and even sort of how postmodernism has redefined our reality. And so it's very encouraging to hear about all your successes. And, you know, I would posit that in a society that where we have laws on paper, yet corporations, businesses don't abide by our constitutional principles, we're not really seeing a free society because we can't really function if our neighbors and our employers won't or if our if they parrot the priorities of these these new left-wing movements so i was curious about how long it typically takes when you see these victories for that to trickle down into society where we actually experience the freedom instead of being under this sort of totalitarian cloud where if you don't mimic the priorities of of the regime in power, you're basically cast out of society and can't function anymore. Yeah, I, you know, it's sort of a weird time because everything's really dark, uh, but the one place that it's not dark is in the courts because the Constitution's just fully alive there with good judges and justices uh, to do these. And again, I'm not saying that you might not like that the justices haven't done everything you want them to do, but they're not doing bad things. They're, they're, their decisions are correct. They just might not go as far as you want right now, as quickly as you want. So the courts are really a great place right now. But I think the answer to your question, I don't think the courts, I think the courts are really important, but I think the ultimate answer to what you're talking about is gonna be the, the American people and their willingness to stand up and say no. Um, and enough, if enough people, look at what Southwest Airlines pilots are doing right now, okay? <clears throat> it doesn't take a majority of people to do this. This is what that book I'm talking about says. It doesn't take, you know, 40, 50 percent. It might do 10 percent. But if enough people will stand up and say no, um, that's when, you know, now I think the cases give them fuel. And, a, and somewhat of a backing, you know, and we say, we've got the Constitution, why don't you stand up? 
Um, but it's going to take people, and I'll, I'll give you one story that, to me, I still get chills, but I've, I see a lot of these kinds of stories. But we had a guy a number of years ago, they had a Christmas celebration. And his kid, I don't know if you've seen the legend of the candy cane. It's a little poem about Jesus and how the candy cane is J for Jesus and all this stuff. And they were all told to bring 20 gifts for, I think they called it a winter celebration. You know, like we all celebrate winter. Um, so he brought a little poem and a candy cane pen, because you couldn't bring candy, and a little bag. And the teacher said, you can't give this to your friends because this has religious things in it. And he went home crying, wondering what he'd done wrong. His gifts were turned away. Well, his father was just furious. And he called us and he said, what, you know, what do we do? We said, well, the first thing, we send a letter to the school. We tell them, look, this is unconstitutional. Uh, we're going to either let you correct this or we'll have a federal judge correct it for you. We'd, we'd rather try with a nice way first. But by this time, we realized, we had talked to the client enough to realize this dad was a printer. 80% of his business was the school district. And so we said, look, this could cost your business. And I heard a very short pause. And he said, send the letter. My son is watching me. Mm. And I thought, that's what America is all about right there. I may do a different case here. You deal with issues where employer, employee, government and employee, military and military, and I'll have military contractors in the military. They all come under different laws. Yep. Some of the FARS laws, some different laws. Yep. The issue I'm going to describe to you right now happened real life last week. <clears throat> the issue is patient hospital. An individual who had been sick for about a while, for about a week or so, an employer went to see him at his house, and he, it seemed that he was sick. Well, I'm trying to get better. Well, the employee called an ambulance for him and took him to the hospital. Not his choice. While in the hospital, he's already in the hospital. When they said, well, we think you got COVID, so here is our remedy. Through the book, the military, the government says that we must give you and disavron A, B, C, D, and E. He objects. He says, I object to that. I just want ivermectin. The, the doctor argues, no, you can't. You're going to do this. The paper says we must do this, this, and this. He says, I'm out of here. No, you're not. They sustain him. They tranquilize him for three days. They put him under, and they did treat him with uh, mendesrib and put him on the ventilator. Well, his funeral was Saturday. Yeah. The remedy between a patient and a hospital, what is it? Uh, what you're describing is a tort, what's called a tort, uh, wrongful death. Um, I mean, there's hospitals and doctors are sued all the time. Um, uh, wrongful death, uh, you know, maybe even false imprisonment. I mean, all kinds of, these are all state laws regarding torts, meaning you, you harm somebody and you, the person who causes the harm has to pay uh, for what they did. And so those are just a matter of state laws, uh, what's called tort laws, that deal with different types of torts. I know Eric is in here somewhere, Eric Johnson, who we've been, there he is. You probably know plenty of torts uh, that you can line up here. Eric and I worked together 30 years ago on cases, so uh, we're both a little too old. But uh, uh, that's all that is. It's, it's just people violating uh, state laws. Uh, in this case, there's probably lots of case law on all these different torts, including with hospitals and, and people that do things against people's wishes. And you just have to get a good tort lawyer that understands those areas and can proceed. Thank yeah. Thank you. Okay, last question. <laughs> Huntsville Hospital. All right, last question. Um, my son works for a, an airline industry, and they're, as you know, they're being uh, required to be vaccinated. His is, his date's within five or six weeks, hmm. or he loses his job. Um, he's wrestling with religious exemption on that. I think what would help him further, and because I'm seeing different viewpoints on the vaccine, whether it's from aborted fetal tissue or not. Right. Uh, I don't know if your website addresses that, if there's a consistency on the vaccines about aborted fetal tissue, which would push him over and say, I, I can't do that. Yeah, do yeah I, I, we don't, because our approach is generally not to tell people anything about religion, but 
to fight for religious freedom for people who disagree about all kinds of things. I mean, even people, we've represented the Falun Gong before, right? Um, so we, we just, it's just religious freedom. But there are people who have done significant, uh, you know, uh, writings on that type of thing, on about what the different um, fetal lines and how they were used. And again, there are people that don't even, that is not even their approach. Their approach is more of a, my body is a temple, uh, the Lord has directed me to not take this vaccine. So I mean, there's different, what we have on our website is an example of both of those, a fetal kind of exemption request and uh, one that's more of my body as a temple request. And I would just say, you know, there's tons of research that's out there. If you Google, uh, you know, uh, from different people, different pro-life groups, others, and then he just needs to kind of figure out where he fits in that because ultimately, it's not even what is generally acceptable, it's what is his sincerely held religious belief. Even if they disagree with it, even if they don't think it's rational, if it's sincerely held and it's his, he has a right to it. Thank you. At the beginning, um, at the beginning of the meeting, like I said, this was supposed to be at a, a kitchen table, literally, about a week and a half ago, and so this came together quickly, and I hope that um, it was beneficial so if you will join, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for everyone here. Thank you especially um, for the attorneys and for Kelly for coming in town, for giving us hope. Father, we, um, we pray for forgiveness for the times that we lose hope, that we lose heart, that we forget that you see around every corner and you know the result of all of our lives and you have already written the story. Father, we pray that you will watch over each of us and our families, help us to be bold, help us to be strong, help us to step out in our faith and speak truth every day. Father, thank you for this time together and we pray that you will continue to bless the connections made here in order to help the individuals and the families who need help. And Father, we pray for your blessings over everyone here. Thank you so much. Amen.